Ever since I started my main Sengoku Jidai series, one of the biggest moments I have been eagerly awaiting to cover was that of the Great Battle of Sekigahara, a defining conflict in Japanese history that sealed the fate of the nation and ushered in the reign of Tokugawa Ieyasu, the samurai lord who would go down in history as Japan's final great unifier and who would establish the Edo Bakufu the shogunal government which would rule the land throughout the coming centuries. This clash, which occurred in the year 1600, has become one of the most highly romanticized battles in Japanese history, and perhaps the most important of the entire Sengoku period. As those who fought have become immortalized through various portrayals over the years, from writings and plays during the Edo period to manga, films, and games today. Such names as Tokugawa Ieyasu and Ishida Mitsunari are sure to live on forever, as well as the many others who joined them. At long last, in January of this year, I finally reached this significant moment in history and put out my full video detailing the battle itself, a culmination of the prior five videos in the series which this had been building up to. And now, with the Sekigahara conflict done in my series, I think it is time we took a look at one of the most famous and recent portrayals of this monumental historic event. A film that many of you have been asking me to review. A film which was released back in 2017, simply called Sekigahara. This depiction of Sekigahara was directed by Masato Harada, who I need to mention also played the character Omura in The Last Samurai. His film Sekigahara is a two and a half hour long historical epic, which although you may think is trying to follow the events of real history, is actually based on the 1966 novel of the same name written by Ryatoro Shiba. So really, right off the bat, this is a work of historical fiction, and not a film trying hard to represent the real historical figures and events. So, as I usually do with films that are clearly historical fiction, I will not be too hard on the film for its historical inaccuracies, but instead will look to discuss how it goes about telling its story, and how it connects to real history. And because it does connect to real history, there will obviously be spoilers ahead. Now, I really didn't know what to expect going in. Was it going to be a bit more on the colorful and cheesy side, like a lot of modern samurai films and TV shows? Or would it surprise me and be a bit more of a grounded and gripping tale? But I am happy to say that overall, I really did enjoy it, more so than I thought I was going to. Over the years, I have read, heard, or have been told some rather negative things about the film, so my expectations were already low from the start. And I am glad that they were so low, because when I actually did watch it, I found it to be much better than what I was expecting. It is a bit of a slow burn, with a lot of political intrigue and scheming, with almost zero action until we at last see the great battle occur towards the end of the film. But I will warn you that if you do not know a lot of the background historical details surrounding the build-up to the Battle of Sekigahara, you may get lost very quick. They talk through a lot of dense information that a lot of viewers would likely know nothing about and have no clue on the relevancy or importance of if they do not know the history, which is why this film was perhaps only intended for Japanese audiences, because they likely would know the history. And this also includes the history of the Imjin War, the samurai invasion of Korea throughout the 1590s that this film touches on quite a bit. And these are all things I am actually a bit glad they do. It would be easy to tell this story using only the big picture events and skipping over plenty of the minor details, but if they did skip over some of these things, you would not have nearly as deep or thorough a story. Like Akira Kurosawa's Kagimusha, this film expects you to know the history so that it can play off of the real events and figures, giving it the freedom to tell its own story, without getting bogged down having to explain too much. It does suck that this would hurt the investment of a casual foreign viewer, but let's be honest, you are probably only watching this movie if you know the history anyway. This story goes far to touch on Toyotomi Hideyoshi's death the fallout from the failure of the Imjin War, and the splintering of factions that would later lead to the Battle of Sekigahara itself. Which I need to say, it sets up perfectly, as proper time and attention is given to each major character and event, so that when the battle does erupt, it does so with a massive crescendo of drama. 
Not to mention the fact that the battle itself takes up what feels like to be an entire quarter of the film, and isn't just a one-off that ends as quick as it begins. It is huge and it is epic, and although you never really get a great shot of showing how big or grand the clash is, you still get a good sense of the scope of it. Now, I have to say, this story is one that does much to really prop up the figure of Ishida Mitsunari. This is definitely his story, and really an exploration and explanation of his motives in working against Tokugawa Ieyasu in trying to preserve the Toyotomi name. From his childhood, to his service under Hideyoshi, to after Hideyoshi's death, the film through flashbacks explore what is driving Mitsunari and why he would oppose the hostile actions of Ieyasu, who was trying to usurp power. However, with that said, it is also a fair bit of propaganda, making Mitsunari seem like really the good guy without any faults, while Ieyasu is clearly an ambitious antagonist. One of the main reasons for Mitsunari's actions is constantly said to be justice, or preserving a world of justice, something along those lines. Something which the famous samurai and retainer of Mitsunari, Shima Sakon, calls out. Being that Mitsunari served Hideyoshi, who himself did not appear to be someone who valued the concept of justice, having seized control of the remains of the Oda regime and used it to create his own. However, with Ieyasu on the verge of doing almost exactly the same thing, Mitsunari wishes to thwart his efforts and preserve the legacy of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the man who gave Mitsunari everything and made him who he is. And although the story does a great job filling in plenty of other details, unfortunately, in terms of Mitsunari himself, it does leave a fair bit out. What could be the case is that some of the details may have been lost in the translation through the film's subtitles. But really, what it seems like the story was trying to do was fill in some of the gaps for Mitsunari while skipping out on the rest. For example, the film does not do anything to really make Mitsunari seem like he had any faults of his own. Every error he makes seems to be a genuine mistake, and his humble nature makes it all the more forgivable. Really, the only time we see him in even a slightly arrogant manner is when he is berating Kobayakawa Hideaki before Hideyoshi for his failures during the Imjin War. A crucial moment because it would plant the seeds that allowed Ieyasu to swoop in and gain the support of Hideaki. Which, by the way, without getting into too many details, the way Hideaki is portrayed is too unlike anything else I have seen before and was rather refreshing. Additionally, we don't see why plenty of the other daimyo distrusted Mitsunari, and why his previous behavior had led to a general bad reputation. And obviously, a bit of this is simply due to how the story is framing Mitsunari. He is not being portrayed in the usual way, as an arrogant, self-interested bureaucrat. But rather, the story is showing him to be someone who is trying to do right by Hideyoshi, and in doing so, helping to establish peace and stability across Japan, in a way that would allow for the Toyotomi regime to flourish for generations to come. Was that really how Ishida Mitsunari was in history? Well, maybe a bit, but there is also plenty of other things that go into who he was, including his faults. 400 years later, it is hard to really know what he was after. But to portray Mitsunari in strictly a positive light is, I think, the wrong thing to do. What should have been the case was that the film could have mixed in elements of his more negative qualities so that we could receive a more well-rounded representation of the figure. But still, I have to say that this is a very human depiction of Mitsunari, and a welcome one that I have never seen before. Junichi Okada, the actor who played Ishida Mitsunari, did an outstanding job. This is really a defining performance, filled with all sorts of emotional nuances. And the same goes for Koji Yakusho, who played Tokugawa Ieyasu, who gives, in my opinion, one of the best portrayals of Ieyasu that I have ever seen, truly showcasing him in all the ways that fit into who we know the figure, or in this case, the character to have been. He lashes out at appropriate moments, and laughs at things that he would obviously find comical. Not to mention he really looks the part, and the film even goes on to address his weight gain in his later years. I really loved both of these performances, and they truly are one of the largest driving factors that bring this film home for me. But there is a weak part of both the characters and the plot that I need to address. That being a bit of the elements surrounding the character and subplot of Hatsume and the ninja. Without going into too many details, Hatsume is sort of a love interest for Mitsunari, who also happens to be a shinobi from Iga, 
She sort of acts as an informant for Mitsunari, helping him learn what Ieyasu is scheming. That is fine, and honestly I thought the connection and attachment they felt towards each other was genuine and well fleshed out. The issue with her and her subplot simply have to do with the over-romanticization of Ninja. You have people doing tons of backflips and constantly talking about how they have superior senses and abilities because they are Ninja. It just really pulled me out of the story and made me shake my head. If they had just toned all the ninja stuff down a bit, I think it would have been completely fine, because her and her plot was not bad at all. It was just all the extra ninja this or ninja that that felt a bit cheesy and out of place when surrounded by everything else. Did Shinobi exist as spies and agents of espionage? Absolutely. And this film showcases the base level of that really well. It's just when it digs more into the over-romanticized pop culture ninja tropes that I feel like it's a bit too much. But that is not the only thing that is historically inaccurate. Yeah, I know this was based off of a book, so I won't go too far into the accuracy of things, but there is some stuff regarding the battle itself that I do want to mention. For one, there were way too many explosions going off during the battle itself, and there was honestly one moment that felt like a Michael Bay film. There is also a moment with a massive gunpowder explosion on the battlefield that is super crazy. They show cannons being used by the Western Army, which explains a bit of the explosions, yet cannons being present at the battle at all is still something that is widely debated by historians to this day. Additionally, we see plenty of other strange weapons in that of throwing axes or knives and even a number of crossbows. Now, I am not saying that none of these weapons existed in medieval Japan, and I am sure that certain battles somewhere throughout Japanese history incorporated them, but they do definitely stand out as not the norm and a bit of a strange choice. And the last odd thing I feel like I have to mention is the leper Otani Yoshitsugu, who during the middle of the battle was being carried around on his palanquin, swinging his sword and leading his troops from the front. Honestly, this just made me laugh because it reminded me of a certain Warhammer character. Now, do all of these crazy weapons, explosions, and other things make the battle, or film in general, bad? Well, I guess it depends how anal you are about historical accuracy. For me, being that this is a film based on a novel and is already clear historical fiction, I just shrug it off. I don't really have a big issue with it. This is what separates it from something like Age of Samurai Battle for Japan. Because while Age of Samurai was awful because it was trying to peddle itself as being a historically accurate docuseries, when it was often neither of those things, Sekigahara is historical fiction, and is not trying to portray itself as perfectly accurate. It's just trying to tell a story inspired by a book, which itself was inspired by real history. All in all, I found the battle thrilling to watch, and probably the most entertaining portrayal of the Battle of Sekigahara there has ever been on screen. And that is kind of a good segue to the last thing I want to talk about here, how the film fared in terms of cinematography, music, and editing. Now, I'm someone who over the years has really come to appreciate these details, as I feel any film needs them to be just as good as the story and acting itself if it is going to succeed. Which is why a film like Dune is so hard for me to like, because although the cinematography, editing, and music were outstanding, I never really got invested in the story or its characters. In terms of Sekigahara, it was a bit of a mixed bag, as you may have perhaps heard me say about plenty of films before that are not specifically Kurosawa. For me, I felt the cinematography was pretty good, the framing was great, it was artful and meaningful, with solid use of coloring, and the music too was also well done and memorable, yet it did repeat itself quite a bit. The editing, however, left a bit to be desired, specifically in terms of the pacing. There are strange moments of time being sped up or slowed down, and extremely abrupt time jumps, where one second something important will be happening, and before you can even blink, you'll be transported several years later. It just did not feel polished, and instead felt like it all could have been perfected a bit better. That may not be an issue for some people, but for me it definitely was. Alright, let's talk about my final rating for the film. After really thinking hard about it, I give Sekigahara 3 stars out of 4. While its characters and plot are outstanding, telling a riveting tale about figures who are portrayed very well, its historical accuracy is a bit on the fence. Most of it really does not matter because it is historical fiction, 
but elements like the over-romanticizing of Ninja and Mitsunari's own life seem like they could have been handled better. And of course, as we just discussed, while the film's cinematography and score were really good, the editing itself missed the mark. Sekigahara is a film I was expecting to probably not like, but I came out pleasantly surprised. Does it have issues? Absolutely. But is it still a very enjoyable time? Also, absolutely. It is a great showcase of how good modern, big-budget samurai historical epics can be, which is something I really feel deserves a ton of praise, because I would love to keep seeing more films in the same fashion. Between now this and The Floating Castle, which I reviewed previously, I am way more optimistic about modern samurai films than I was before. I strongly recommend this film to anyone who enjoys Japanese or specifically samurai history. However, just remember to go in not expecting to receive a completely accurate take, but rather a bit more of a unique fictional one that still does a lot to incorporate the real history. But with that said, have you seen Sekigahara? If so, what did you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.